Tonight, uh, I was going to talk about printed circuit boards uh, for fun in ham radio. And so um, I just thought it's uh, hopefully be an interesting topic for everyone. Uh, it's one of those things that isn't necessarily for everyone, but it is something that could be useful to anyone. And I, I believe it's uh, learning how to, to work with and design printed circuit boards is a skill that just about anyone can acquire if they want to. Um, so uh, with that in mind, a little bit of an agenda, um, kind of the what, when, where, how, and why of printed circuit boards. And then we'll delve into uh, an example project, um, which as uh, John alluded to may uh, spawn into further, uh, further things, but we'll get into that in a moment. Um, actually, I guess I already gave this disc disclaimer, but um, the idea that this is something that may not be for everyone, but uh, hopefully it is for many people anyways. Um, the, the kind of the why a printed circuit board is to address the issue of how do I take electronic components and put them together in an organized manner. Uh, there's actually several methods to do this. Um, the first one that's kind of near and dear to my heart would be a breadboard. And so this is, uh, of course, generally speaking, a temporary way to do things. Um, it's good for prototyping. Uh, you can obviously move things around quite easily because you basically have a board full of sockets. Um, of course, the things that you have going against doing something like this, especially for something that's a more permanent arrangement, is it's pretty fragile. It's easy to catch a wire with uh, your elbow as you, you know, spin around in your chair or, or with a tool or something and pull a wire out. And then you, where, where, did, where did that go? Um, Obviously, it's, it can be a little bit difficult to organize, so it can be very messy. Uh, and generally speaking, it's not good for anything above a few hundred kilohertz. Uh, so RF is typically, um, you, it's, you can only do limited experimentation on a breadboard. Um, then we have perf boards. We think back to uh, Radio Shack. They sold lots of these. And... Uh, it's basically a printed circuit board in generic form that has lots of uh, places to solder to. And then, of course, you have to interconnect things, usually with wires, uh, or you can get a little bit creative with the leads on the backside of the board. But um, this tends to be good for permanent things to a point. Um, you have to solder. You have to um, actually, I probably shouldn't call that a con, but it is a good thing to note. Um, it can be a little, it can get messy pretty quickly, similar to a breadboard. Um, and using surface mount parts, which is becoming more and more and more of something that uh, you will uh, probably want to do, if not have to do, if you're designing something. Uh, it, it's difficult, uh, or in some cases, impossible without uh, like a special adapter of some sort. Um, and then here again, high frequency can get to be an issue. Uh, so RF is kind of a use with caution. Um, there's, of course, wire wrap, which uh, nobody does. And I don't know who invented this, um, but they should be punished in some way. Um, kit bashing, which I borrow that term from uh, the model railroad hobby. But uh, although it, I'm, it may have been used in the amateur radio context as well, I'm not sure. But the idea of taking multiple already prefabricated uh, circuit assemblies uh, and stringing them together, usually with some sort of wires or jumper connectors uh, to build something else. Uh, there's actually quite a bit uh, of stuff out there targeted both at the hobbyist market and also in the engineering design space, uh, which can do special purpose things. So if you say, oh, I really would like an accelerometer uh, well, you could go on to sparkfun.com and find an accelerometer board and then figure out a way to connect that up to another microcontroller board, such as an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. Uh, probably heard of those things, if not already worked with them. And uh, so this is a perfectly valid way of doing things. Um, generally speaking, it's not for anything you would want to mass produce. 
Uh, and it's generally also pretty hard to make compact if that is a goal. And then we move on to printed circuit boards. And so printed circuit boards, um, they are I, what I would consider the most mechanically robust option. They're easy to um, reproduce, uh, you know, manufacture that sort of thing. They generally, if, if well designed, are easier to assemble and more straightforward because you've already kind of gone through the design process um, and you're not sort of wiring from a schematic, uh, which also usually, again, <laughs> asterisk, uh, lends itself to being easier to do debugging on and, and figuring out what's going wrong. Um, something that I consider a big pro is that it tends to force you to document your design uh, a little bit better because generally speaking, you're working with a schematic capture program, unless you've laid out your circuit board by hand. And then that is then going into a schematic or sorry, a um, printed circuit board layout program. And so those two things are generally linked together in such a way that if you make a change on the schematic, it's going to be reflected on the circuit board. And so it's very hard to have a schematic that doesn't match a circuit board. Um, Obviously, surface mount is uh, you can you can use very easily with printed circuit boards, and um, this would be a necessity if you're dealing with uh, VHF and higher. If you're if you're doing something with RF, um, kind of the drawbacks, uh, if you will, or at least the things to keep in mind, is that it is a acquired skill and it does take time to learn how to use a piece of software create a printed circuit board. And generally speaking, you don't get it right the first time. So um, uh, those are considerations worth noting. And also you're more than likely going to be ordering it from someone. So you're not going to be able to immediately produce what you design, um, unlike something that like a perf board or a breadboard. Uh, kind of a quick history of printed circuit boards. Um, really, the, the idea has been around since the late 1800s. And uh, so people have kind of uh, poked around with laying out uh, copper traces on some sort of a substrate for the better part of 50 years. But where it really took off, and I found this very interesting, was in World War II, which probably isn't that surprising, but it was with proximity shells. Um, that was really kind of the first major use uh, and the reason was one of really necessity, because when you fire a shell out of a gun, you're dealing with about 20,000 G's of acceleration and uh, a large vacuum tube hand wired to a bunch of other parts generally is not going to survive that. So uh, printed circuit boards allowed for a much more manufacturable, compact assembly that could use much smaller components and um, withstand uh, the, the high G-forces involved, albeit with uh, quite a bit of potting material, I think. Um, you really start, the print, or really start to see the printed circuit board take off in the late 60s and, and early 70s, um, whereas before that time, everything was kind of hand-wired uh, together for the most part. All right, printed circuit boards, how are they made? Uh, it's helpful to kind of know if, if you just decide that this is something you want to explore just a little bit about um, how they're made and uh, wh where they come from. And so um, what you see over on the right is a sheet of raw material, which is, I guess, not really technically raw material. It is a uh, fiberglass substrate sandwich with copper on, the, on both sides of it. Um, but this is typically what would show up at the printed circuit board manufacturer's loading dock and what they would then go to turn into your board. Uh, this is what they would start with. So the, the general process is you start with uh, drilling uh, the board out and then uh, for any holes you might need and then plating those holes, doing some etching, uh, applying etching is probably the step that everyone thinks of, and then uh, hopefully applying a solder mask and then even uh, some silk screen to make things easier. And uh, obviously I'm doing a very high level overview. There are many more specific steps and there's actually quite a bit on YouTube that you can see specifics. Um, to take kind of a cross-sectional view uh, here in the middle of the screen, 
and a top down view on the right, just to give you an idea of if you've never seen a printed circuit board or kind of how it's uh, really put together. You have that sandwich I was talking about with uh, copper on top and then the substrate in the middle and copper on the bottom. And so they take that and the first thing that the manufacturer is going to do is they're going to drill holes in it. And then is uh, shortly after they do that and probably do a little deburring, then they will plate those holes so that they connect from the top to the bottom. So that's known as a plated through hole. Um, that allows for a connection to jump from one side of the board to the other. It also makes it uh, more secure when you're soldering through hole components because now the solder is going into the hole, not just on the top of the, uh, the copper or the top surface or bottom surface of the copper. Uh, the next step would be to etch away the parts of the copper that you no longer want. And then um, this used to be a bonus step, but now it's pretty much standard for any manufacturer uh, is to put a solder mask on. And the solder mask is really helpful because that uh, insulates everything except for where you're planning on soldering. And it also resists, it's called solder mask or solder resist, uh, resists solder uh, from going places you don't want it. So it makes it harder to short, unintentionally short out connections. And then finally, uh, a silk screen, which is uh, really, really helpful. And I would say in many ways, very important uh, for knowing and assembling your circuit board, especially if you might not be the only one who's going to put it together. And frankly, even if you are the only one that's going to be putting it together, I don't remember what I did a week ago. So it's always good to have clues. Um, so the, the workflow that we're talking about here, you usually are going to start with some form of design requirement. Um, you know, I want to make a flashlight and then you're going to set out on paper and kind of come up with your basic concept of that. Maybe you want to prototype it. Um, maybe you just skip that step depending on uh, your level of confidence in your circuit. Then the part that always takes surprisingly long, go on to DigiKey or Mauser or your other or your favorite parts uh, supplier or into your junk bin and pick parts out that you're planning on using. And then uh, you create uh, probably at more or less the same time, a schematic in CAD. Um, again, there are ways to still do this by hand, but it, uh, it, if it's something that you plan on doing uh, in any amount, it's, the computer does make things ultimately easier. There's a learning curve, but it, it really helps um, in the end. Uh, so once you've got your circuit in CAD, then you move into PCB layout. And then once you have completed that, then you'll generate some Gerbers, send it off to a manufacturer or possibly etch it yourself. And then when you get those parts back, uh, put it together and um, enjoy, of course. So uh, that's the part that we're gonna be focusing on uh, from this point forward. Uh, again, high level overview stuff. I'm not trying to do a tutorial on any particular piece of software. Um, so kind of what this looks like and again, what we're showing on the screen is actually something I'm gonna talk about in a little more detail in a little bit here. But um, we have uh, a schematic on the left, uh, which is the um, symbolic representation of your electrical connections, which then over on the right becomes a layout. <clears throat> so going through the layers as uh, they would look coming out of your, your printed circuit board layout CAD, um, we kind of have this stack up of different things. Uh, on the bottom was a solder mask and then we're going through and there's our copper layers and uh, some more solder mask and a silk screen on top. And if you actually ever have looked into a Gerber file, which is the file that most board manufacturers use to produce circuit boards, it looks something like this. And really all it is is X, Y coordinates. Um, all right, so printed circuit board layout software. Um, this is really, in some ways, half the reason why I'm giving this talk uh, is uh, that in recent years, some really pretty decent layout software has uh, been created by the open source community called KiCad. Um, there are, um, there's another program called Eagle, which probably a number of you have heard of and maybe even used, 
that used to be sort of the preeminent um, DIYer software, and it was quite limited. And if I may be so bold as to say, it kind of sucked. Um, the uh, obviously there are plenty of uh, professional software packages out there, and they are quite expensive. Um, they usually start at $500 and get up into the $5,000 range pretty quickly for a single license. So that's usually out of the uh, reach of most amateurs and hobbyists. Um, there is another kind of third option that sits in the middle, which is a lot of the American board manufacturers to try to sweeten the deal have created their own layout pack, uh, layout software um, among them, uh, advanced, uh, advanced circuits and uh, Express PCB both have their own layout software. And so that's also something that can be explored, but the difficulty with that is you're usually locked into using their services for making the boards. And they, you, I don't think will release the Gerber files for, to you. So you could never take them somewhere else. Um, but again, KiCad is the one uh, to check out if you're interested. All right, so let's say that you have created a printed circuit board design and the question is, well, now what do I do? Well, um, as I alluded to earlier, you can actually make this yourself. Uh, and that's also probably something the number of you have done. Um, I would say that it's an experience. Uh, thank God that the house that we were living in at the time, my parents' house had plastic pipes. Um, when I did this and uh, the, uh, the middle bathroom was taken up for quite a bit of time as a dark room. Um, and as I kind of conclude here, this is uh, one of those experiences that you'll probably come away with saying that was fun and let's not do it again. Um, but there's what a home etched uh, printed circuit board might look like uh, here. Again, you're not getting anything but the traces and you're not getting plated through holes. So um, be careful when you solder these types of things because it's easy to make short circuits. There's another way of doing this. Uh, well, I don't know if I could say at home, if you're willing to go out and spend a, a couple grand on a CNC, then you could do it at home. Uh, but you can use a CNC and actually engrave the circuit boards. Or if you have a friend that has one, um, you can actually engrave them. Um, there's some specialized software that's out there that's designed to do that. Um, but again, no solder mask, no silk screen no plated through holes, uh, and it just, it, it can be a bit of a fussy process. Um, the route that I would recommend for folks that were looking to do something like this would be to order them. There are several sources out there, or uh, probably a lot more than several, but uh, a few of note stateside, you have advanced circuits and they have a uh, $33 each special uh, for prototypes, and that's, you know, for anyone who wants to order from them, it's not limited to commercial interests. Uh, the catch is that there's a minimum of five and there's like a 30 or $40 handling fee. So it really comes out to, you're going to drop 185 to $200 uh, to take advantage of that, even if you only want one circuit board. Uh, there are uh, a few batching services, which basically take and combine people's orders together to try to get a lower price. Um, at the time I put this presentation together, which was a few months ago, their prices were, I think, around $5 per square inch uh, from OS OSH Park, um, which if you're doing a really small board is probably a decent deal, but if you're not, then it gets expensive quickly. Uh, and then finally, the other half of the reason why I'm doing this presentation is that in the last five years, the uh, printed circuit board market not surprisingly has been taken over by China. But what is interesting is that they have really started to target the um, hobbyist and maker market. And so you can get a uh, printed circuit board in a decent size. And we're talking probably about, you know, four inches by six inches kind of size for $5 for five. And that's not $5 for each PCB, that's $5 for the whole thing. The shipping is actually going to cost about three times as much as the circuit boards. So um, this starts to really bring um, the uh, ability to make PCBs into uh, or accessible for people uh, who are hobbyists like me um, and uh, that need to do things on a budget. 
Uh, it's a little bit hard to justify paying $200 for something, uh, but for $30 and at my door in about uh, seven or eight days, it, uh, now, now there are some projects that I can start to tackle. All right, so uh, as an example, uh, I wanted to uh, tackle a project that I'd been kind of poking or has been kind of bouncing around in my head for a while. And so I wanted to come up with a practice oscillator for CW. Uh, I don't know CW. I'd like to learn it. Um, and uh, one of the things that was a big barrier uh, as a technician um, is that I didn't have access to HF. So uh, I wouldn't really be able to practice this other than I suppose nowadays we have Zoom so we could, we could do that. Um, but uh, and there's not really a good way to do it over VHF um, unless you have you know, a radio that's really set up for that sort of thing. But uh, most entry level technicians generally only have access to an HT or maybe a mobile radio. So I wanted to make uh, a practice oscillator that would potentially be able to actually interface with uh, an HT and allow practicing over the air so that um, you can kind of have a little bit more of a real feel to it. Um, so my design requirements, if you will, um, I wanted something that would automatically key the radio so that I wouldn't have to remember to push a button or flip a switch before I start keying the radio. Um, although that does bring in to play possibly a timing problem because obviously uh, if you've ever worked with voice operated um, Vox systems, they tend to cut off the first word. So that was a problem that it needed to deal with. Uh, I wanted the ability for it to operate standalone so it could be just act just like a conventional uh, practice oscillator. I wanted it to um, be help or be useful for the beginner. So uh, if they were going to use an HT to try to practice, I wanted them also to be able to use their voice uh, uh, without plugging and unplugging things. Because um, uh, generally speaking, when you plug in something into the microphone port of your HT, you probably won't be able to use the internal speaker any longer. Uh, until you unplug. Um, I wanted it to be something that could potentially be used as a kit uh, and that other people can build, not just me. And um, I was hoping to build something that could connect to many different brands of radios, uh, not just my own. So the first thing I did was I sat down and sketched out kind of a block diagram. So even before creating a schematic, I wanted to sort of pick the high level pieces that uh, I was going to need to then design the circuits for. And so this is that block diagram. Um, and then uh, just to kind of clean it up a little bit so it's a little bit more uh, evident what's going on. Essentially, you have a HT on the all the way on the right, which is where everything is going to, uh, or I guess coming from as well. And then on the left, uh, the ability to use a key, external keyer or just a push button switch to, to um, create the dits and das. And so in order to kind of tie all that together, uh, I decided I wanted to have a microcontroller um, that would handle uh, the issue I mentioned before about uh, keying the radio and uh, providing some delay in order to not cut off uh, your, your first uh, dit or da. Uh, so here is the finished schematic, uh, at least for the prototype. And um, I won't go into too much detail about that, although if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to ask them uh, at, at the end. Um, so after creating the schematic, I then started the board layout. And so I've actually took a, a screen video of doing that. And I apologize for how much it bounces around, but uh, this is, represents about two and a half or three hours worth of work in about two minutes. So there's a lot of zooming in and zooming out. But just to kind of give a, a tour of the process, if you will, the first thing I'm doing is placing all of the parts onto the board. And there's quite a bit of rearranging. So you kind of start with a rough placement, say, well, uh, I want my push buttons and things down here, and I want my speaker over there. And then uh, oh yeah, I need a battery holder and a power button. I want to make sure they're easy to get to. Uh, and then, then you have all the intermediate components. And so you just kind of start working them in and uh, around each other. And it's definitely a little bit of a, a circular process. 
um, as you place things and then realize, oh, they might be a little better. I can make the traces a little shorter by putting something over here, or over there. Uh, once that's done, uh, I'm actually cleaning up the silk screen. So trying to add annotations and uh, text to make it easy to tell, for instance, what part is what reference designator. Reference designators, by the way, are extremely helpful and you should always use them if you're doing any sort of design, but particularly a printed circuit board design, uh, because they allow you to correlate a physical part on your board back to your schematic without any question. And so uh, it's always a good idea to go through and clean that up and make that really nice and readable, especially if you're gonna spend all the time to make a printed circuit board anyways, a few extra minutes of cleanup is a good idea. Now, of course, we're routing traces um, and putting on a ground plane, which is kind of the part everyone thinks about when doing a circuit board. Uh, I've sort of glossed over it here, but um, that part actually went fairly quickly in this, in this case, uh, in part due to spending a lot more time on the front end with the placement and trying to minimize the amount of traces. Um, last thing I'm kind of doing here is going through and consolidating the number of drill hits, which is probably not necessarily important, but um, it means that the manufacturer has a little easier time making your board because uh, they have less drill bits that they have to uh, load into their machine. Okay. So, um, no, I didn't want to do that. Next. All right. So um, that's sort of uh, our uh, screenshot representation of the circuit board. And then there's the actual board itself. And uh, that's not a blank or, or a... Uh, that actually has a solder mask. I just picked a yellow one. That's the other cool thing about these uh, manufacturers that are serving the hobbyist market is they will offer at no or little additional charge uh, silk screen and um, solder mask color customization. So you can get all sorts of different colors. All right, documentation is always crucial when designing a printed circuit board, um, or at least it's one of the uh, things that is really helpful because Generally, it's generated with your design, um, so you don't have to work quite so hard for it. But bill of materials, of course, is um, so that you know what parts you need. A uh, assembly drawing is very helpful. Um, it, even if your printed circuit board is really well laid out and has very clear silk screen, uh, an assembly drawing just make you can print that or blow it up on your screen as big as you like, and it just makes assembly a lot easier. Um, so uh, there's the finished prototype circuit board, uh, top side on the left, bottom side on the right. And there it is with all the parts put in it. Um, real quick, let me switch over here for a moment. And there it is uh, in actuality. And so, just a quick overview of how it operates. We have uh, power to turn the thing on. Good old nine volt battery. Uh, currently I am set to 146.55. I doubt that anyone can hear me. Uh, I'm running 500 milliwatts. But um, the kind of the key features, if you will, are that we have a microphone over here so I can actually uh, do voice. This is Kilo Golf 4, Echo India Foxtrot testing. Uh, and then I can do uh, a key. And that actually keyed the radio. Uh, so you can see if you watch the transmit light, it should turn red. And um, I can also, I have a auxiliary jack here. So we can plug in an actual. Uh, formal key, which I, yes, I do need to mount it on something. Um, and again, something that you might have noticed, uh, this LED here is my transmit LED, and it actually starts transmitting. The microcontroller is uh, starts transmitting as soon as it sees the key go down. Uh, the microcontroller is actually recording, if you will, the, the uh, pattern coming in from the key and then delaying it by about one second so that 
Uh, it gives the time for the radio to start transmitting and the receiving radio's time for their squelch to open. So you don't end up with uh, cut off uh, dits and dahs. All right. Kilo Golf 4, Echo India Foxtrot, testing clear. All right. So that is that. And just to kind of wrap things up, um, I put my source, uh, a few of my sources here, and um, that pretty much wraps it up. So uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I had a, a, a question about the, the software. Um, does that, are the components like like blocks in the software? Do you have to like measure each, you know, resistor or whatever and, and figure that out yourself? Um, can you rephrase the question? <laughs> Uh, I was I was just wondering, like in the software, if they have like pre-made components that are already oh. kind of scaled out, or do you have to draw each component and sit there with the you know micrometer to to, to figure it out? Um, well, so uh, individual components, whether it be a resistor, a capacitor, a microcontroller, uh, a digital signal processor, uh, a power supply module, um, those things are generally speaking going to be pre-drawn both their schematic symbol and also the physical symbol or physical what we would call a footprint that goes on the circuit board itself or is used for the circuit board design those will be in most cases predefined in a library uh, so keycad's really good with that they have quite a few libraries and then many people have created their own libraries and shared them uh, digikey probably being chief among them so uh, if you're, you're not having to sit there and draw resistors and then say, well, that's, th that's pin one and that's pin two. Now, of course you can, and usually there'll always be one part that no one created a symbol for or something, or something unique like that, and that you'll have to go in and figure out how to do it. But, um, but for the most part, you'll be working with, uh, again, with, uh, with KiCad or software like it, you'll be working with mostly things that have been predefined. Now you have to determine how they get connected together. Um, but uh, as far as the, the components, they're, they're already there. Dan, I have a follow on that. But for example, a quarter watt resistor versus a one watt, maybe on a power supply board versus an eighth watt resistor, they're gonna have different footprints. I guess you, that, that's all in your library, correct? Yes, that's correct. And also, was this example pretty much, key? this was not a multi-layer board, this was just a conventional single-layer board, right? Uh, this was two layers. So this, is the yeah. back considered the second layer? Yeah, the bottom is the second layer. Uh, so and I could have I uh, run traces through that. I, I actually ran like one or two, but I was able to keep most of it on the top side, which allowed me to have a pretty solid ground plane. In the manufacturing process, do they actually then automatically drill the holes and then plate it as the next step? Yeah, I believe so. And there's probably some, it, probably each manufacturer has a little different process, but like sort of the general um, steps they follow is a, a drill and then through plating, I believe, because that uh, then they have a solid, car, uh, solid copper surface to aid in that uh, hole plating process. Whereas if they etched um, they, before they did the plating and the through holes, that, they, that would make that harder. Because in the olden days, people would just take a piece of copper wire, mm -hmm. Yep. which is not very reliable. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it, it certainly takes time because every that means if you have a lot of through connections that don't have components in them, then you're spending a lot of time soldering additional things that aren't components. Uh, but yeah, that, um, like I said, that I paid about $30 for those five boards and that included shipping. Uh, and I, that was, there was, it, it wasn't extra cost to get that plated through hole 
uh, you know, two layer board. It was an extra cost for a solder mask and it was an extra cost for a silk screen. So all that so stuff. You're plating it through even when there's no component just to connect the ground planes. Yes, and, and the components are being soldered on the back side of the board. So um, the, that solder usually does wick up through the hole to the top, but um, it, if, even if it doesn't, it's okay because the hole is plated through. So it, it makes things that much easier. Whereas if I, well, I probably wouldn't lay my traces out on the top side. Uh, if I only had one layer, I'd probably try to put them on the bottom, but um, it, yeah, the, I don't have to worry about soldering both sides of the component if they weren't plated through. One of my goals has always been to find some venue where we could do some hands-on. I was thinking of more ancient technology, like doing a hands-on seminar, how to solder PL259s, but it's always been trouble getting a venue that would permit us to solder without fear of us burning it down. <laughs> but after watching your amazing presentation i could see perhaps we could have we could eventually evolve to even build a little transceiver or transitor receiver or just your code practice oscillator and get a group purchase of kitting parts through mouser or digikey and have a couple of saturday sessions as covid winds down yeah well that, that was actually my intention is the presentation was only half the, the kind of the piece the my hope was that perhaps we could turn this this particular board into a kit build as well i know there's some interest in doing some some cw uh learning as well and this might tie well into that but um that that's obviously a discussion for you all not for me i don't know you're an important member of the club but i'd like you to develop this idea well it's it's developed <laughs> it's okay. it's it's there well, all right, I'm done with questions. Does anyone else have any questions to Ben? Wireless uh, has a makers group and they are building two single side band transceivers, you know, using the Arduino chip and then uh, different filters, band pass filter and different things. And about four or five of the guys have actually made contact. They're only about five watts output, single side band or CW. And they're, some of them are working some DX with them. Now, hmm. now some of the guys are having a lot of trouble getting even the first unit built, but uh, then they plan on going up to a 20 meter unit. So wow. these are four there. And they're doing a tremendous job. And they have a makers group on every Wednesday, well, every other Wednesday night now. And they come on a Zoom there with it. It's really a beautiful workmanship and some of them are doing. Like uh, this thing I was just now looking at. Really beautiful. Oh, thank you. I yeah, watch I'm them, but I'm just too old now to my eyesight's gone and I'm legally blind according to the VA and everything. So my dexterity and what it used to be by a long shot. But I'd love to be able to be right in the middle of it. Absolutely. Well, and, and that's, you know, the, the sky's the limit with this because um, as I say, the, the, the boards are, are now affordable enough uh, that, you know, really someone could design something and then just share it with everyone. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, 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 it's a cool, um, it's a cool thing um, that, as I say, it's kind of, it's kind of open to anyone at this point. Uh, I think you made it look easier than, than we might find it, but that's, that's part of the, the thrill of ham radio. <laughs> It's forging way right through, through the things there. Um, well, and I was going to suggest that, uh, that maybe one thing we could do would actually be to send out uh, either set up a poll or something like that to find out sort of how to gauge interest of uh, people in the group in putting together uh, the, one of those kits for doing the, the code training. And, uh, and that way we give, give a little feedback in terms of, of how many people would be interested. But I think the way to do that is maybe send it to the entire group and that people can look at this video. And you know there may be folks that weren't here tonight that might, might be interested in it as well. So uh, that's the proposal. I totally agree. I wanna encourage additional questions if anyone has some. 
I and think another you, question you about that software, um, which was when you started laying the components onto the, um, the actual PCB, mm -hmm. it looked like they were already wired. Like there were all those little white lines and, yes. then, and then you did the real uh, traces later. And I was wondering like, do you, is that just coming off of the schematic that the pins are know where they're going? Yes. So, um, oops. That's um, that that's called the rat's nest. Um, it looks like it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that that is that information is coming directly from the schematic, and that's what's so powerful about using layout software versus doing you know, as I say, kind of doing things by hand or just jumping straight to the printed circuit board. Is uh, as one of my favorite professors uh, at UVA said to me. You can go to sleep at night with the assurance that your schematic is going to uh, match your circuit layout uh, because the, the, the software will hold you to it. It will say that, you know, this pin seven or eight or whatever this is, if U4 attaches to C3 and then jumps over here to uh, R2 pin one, it's, it's not going to allow you to run a trace to a place that it doesn't belong. Um, and it will also keep your traces the required distance apart so that they can't be shorted together. Uh, and also so your board is manufacturable because the, yeah. the manufacturer, if you try to run a trace uh, within two thousandths of an inch next to another trace, they're going to kick that back to you and say, nah, I can't make that because there's a good chance it's the etching process won't actually remove the area between the two of them, yeah. um, which is known as uh, DFM or design for manufacturing. But um, the software will actually uh, prevent you from making a lot of those mistakes, which is really nice. Okay, John, do you have time to do some breakout sessions? I do, but let me, uh, I'm going to end the uh, recording here. So, uh...